Good morning, friends. Today we will be talking about hip arthroscopy in an Indian perspective. Now the main indications for hip arthroscopy are femoroacetabular impingement, synovial pathologies, ligamentum teres rupture, loose bodies and condral lesions inside the hip joint, and snapping hip syndromes. Now. as far as the femoroacetabular impingement is concerned it might be of the pincer variant in which the acetabulum has an elongated bony overgrowth which is pressing on the femoral head or it can be of cam variety in which there is a bony overgrowth in the superior neck of the femur which can cause a impingement but more commonly it is a combined variety in which there are both cam as well as a pincer components now this is on the lateral view the cam lesion is actually the overgrowth of the anterior superior neck and it's a bony overgrowth a pincer lesion is again an anterior superior overgrowth of the acetabular ridge and mixed uh, variant of fai has got both cam as well as pincer features now prevalence of femoral acetabular impingement is about 10 to 15% of population as per the western data but probably its incidence is less in india uh, probably due to our lifestyle sitting cross legged and sitting in squatting position has some protective benefit there is a higher incidence of fai in athletes in martial art players and kickers now this is very important the x ray evaluation the most important thing that we have to see is the lateral center edge angle that is called as lcea and if it is increased it is suggestive of a femoroacetabular impingement the tonis angle is the angle which is between the horizontal line connecting the two femoral heads and the line connecting the medial and the lateral extents of the acetabular roof the crossover sign is again a sign in which there is the anterior wall which projects lateral to the posterior posterior wall before converging into lateral acetabular sursil and it is suggestive of a increased antiversion and a pincer sort of a deformity the posterior wall sign is a sign in which the posterior acetabular wall is medial to the center of the femoral head this is again suggest you of a increased antiversion and increased chances of a pincer impingement and ischial spine sign is a sign in which the ischial spine is visible with the pelvic inlet on the ap view so again a sign of a antiverted pelvis now in the a part we can see that there is a labral tear in the b part we can see that there is a cartilage lesion and in the c there is the radial re reformation of the cyst so there is a cam lesion and underneath you can see the impingement cyst just beneath the cam lesion this is taken from the femoral acetabular impingement article by stephanie poon from arthritis rheumatological in 2015 now this is again a variant of uh, cam lesion in which an osteoplasty has been done and along with that a labral repair has been done now in indian perspective fai is less common uh, the synovial pathologies become more common indications and tuberculosis in active stage is a good indication with both diagnostic and therapeutic role uh, re the required infrastructure for a hip arthroscopy is a traction table a wide central perineal post a 70 degree arthroscope long working length instruments cannulated trocar and cannula half pipes beaver blade beaver blade is also called as a capsulotomy knife now you can do a hip arthroscopy either in a supine position and or in a lateral position both of the positions have their advantages and disadvantages i usually do it in a supine position and when you do it in supine position you take a bulky or a large perineal post to give a lateral as well as a distal traction so we need a lateral traction and distal traction to increase the intra articular space within the hip joint now as far as the portal are concerned uh, we have to mark the greater uh, trochanter and there is a portal above and there is a portal below the greater uh, trochanter that is the anterior lateral and the posterior lateral portals which are the cornerstone portals the important thing is you need to mark the asis and you mark you mark a straight line just beneath the asis and 
all portals which are medial to asis will be risky portals so you make an anterior portal but it should be on the lateral aspect of the line that is drawn from the asis so that makes a safe portal now there is a distal anterior lateral portal which is usually used in a, a peripheral scopy so as far as the hip arthroscopy is concerned there are two compartments the first compartment is the uh, central compartment and the other compartment is the peripheral compartment the central compartment is within the hip joint and the peripheral compartment is in the neck the peripheral compartment is more in the anterior part as compared to the posterior part now this is again a view of the portals that we usually use anterolateral and anterior portal are the main portals you can use posterolateral as a third portal and if you are doing a peripheral uh, arthroscopy peripheral compartment arthroscopy you can use a distal anterolateral portal now interportal capsulotomy is one of the important key steps it is a important maneuver and it in, in increases the maneuverability of your instrument so ideally it should be done between the anterolateral and the anterior portals and you can use either a beaver blade a capsulotomy knife or in some circumstances you can also use your radio frequency device to make the interportal capsulotomy now this is a picture this is uh, from the experts of dr thomas bird and this is a case of synovial chondromatosis which is treated with hip arthroscopy this is again a synovial pathology of pvns which is treated nicely with the use of hip arthroscopy now i'll be presenting some of my cases uh, with an indian perspective in hip arthroscopy the first case is a 35 year old female patient she presented with a limp pain while walking and a groin pain on examination the internal rotation of hip was painful when we get an x ray we get a very characteristic finding there is a paralabral calcification on the left side which is extending from the labrum to the neck of the femur so there is a large para paralabral calcification area which was seen so when we did the ct there was a large calcification this is something sort of a calcific tendinitis in the hip joint in the shoulder joint and the patient was in intense pain so we did a hip arthroscopy we made our standard portals we did it in supine position we make the anterolateral portal as the first portal we put the uh, needle in and once we put the needle in we will see a finding which is called as an air arthrogram which confirms that the needle is inside the uh, joint also the needle can be adjusted because we need to be very sure that the needle is not penetrating through the labrum so when the air arthrogram is made and you when you inject the saline you can actually adjust the position of the needle little bit now this is the intra articular view in the cm with the anterior lateral and the anterior portal in the c2 i usually make my anterior portal by a free hand technique now this is a small video so this is the the hip joint is on the lower side and the labrum you can see on the top side this is the needle which is seen right there we in, we insert an etinol wire from the needle and then we take the needle out and we usually we do a hip arthroscopy with cannulated instruments so cannulated instruments are inserted one by one so here we are inserting a cannulated trocar which is inserted just below the labrum and when it is inserted and this is the pulvinar and this is the hip joint and this is again we can see the needle here the trocar here and we will make a small this is a cannulated instrument we have inserted uh, i usually use a lot of half pipes in this scenario because it increases your maneuverability so we'll insert a half pipe through that and it's taken out the labrum as you see here does not appear to be very normal and a capsulotomy is an important feature so in most of these cases i would like to do a generous capsulotomy so as to increase the maneuverability of my instruments as well as the so a good and generous capsulotomy is performed here a nice and a generous capsulotomy is being performed here 
And once we are there, these are the instruments. Again, as I told you, these are cannulated instruments. And some of these instruments are uh, very good. And this, as I told you, this was a again a needle first place. And from there, you can use a beaver blade to actually increase it. This is a half pipe, and this half pipe is actually facing the upwards. And whenever you are doing any kind of maneuvers with the instruments, you have to be very careful that you don't damage the cartilage of the hip joint because hip joint is a very, very delicate structure. It's not a very uh, forgiving joint. It's not a very loose joint. And when you are doing an arthroscopy, you should be doubly confident about that you don't do any iatrogenic damage to the cartilage. Also, the cartilage loading in the hip joint is very high. So what that means is that whenever you do any kind of a hip arthroscopy, the loading is very high. So the now here we can see that we have exposed the calcification very nicely. All of the calcification is now exposed very nicely and very thoroughly. It is just below the labrum. And you can see that now we can just remove this. There are small granules which, they, which are coming out slowly. And so this is the calcium is just above in a area in, in a pocket just between the labrum and the capsule. And we did a good generous release and we give a good wash and we'll remove all the pathological calcium. This is sort of a deposit that we see in the calcific tendinitis in the hip joint as well. So we do a generous release and generous removal of the calcium deposits from there. We remove everything from there. And once we remove these deposits, then we the other job is now to address any kind of FAI problems. In this particular patient, she was a young, young girl, 30 years of age, so we didn't do a lot of chem osteoplasty, but we definitely would like to uh, uh, do a little bit of labral repair in this case because the labrum is definitely pathological and uh, this was the cause of this kind of a calcific deposits in this in this young lady so thorough removal of the calcium deposits is mandatory and once you remove the calcium then again you can see that there is a pocket just beneath the labrum from which we are taking out the calcium granules once they are taken off it will be a large space from inside so we can see that there is a lot of lot of calcium just above the labral recess. So this is called as a supralabral recess and a lot of calcium deposits is seen in the supralabral recess. And we'll use a probe to identify and see that there is no calcium deposits which is remaining inside. Once we have done that thoroughly, you will see that there will be a lot of the, the labrum will be free. You can use a shaver to debride the edges a little bit. And then you can see that this is the area where we need to do the labral repair. So in this particular patient, we plan to do a labral repair. We did a little bit of debridement. And then this is again an elevator kind of a thing, which we use to elevate the tissue off uh, the pin uh, of the margin of the acetabulum and then we use our device for the labral repair the labral repair there are many techniques which are described for the labral repair uh, you can use either a knotted or a knotless suture anchors here we have which we, uh, here we are inserting a cannula and we usually use a penetrating kind of graspers to pass the threads through the labral tissue once we have done our thorough debridement following that what we can do is we can just pass our, this is a penetrating suture grasper, which is loaded with a fiber wire. And then we take a cinch loop. We take this penetrator out and then we take it from outside in. And then we cinch it over, uh, over it. And in this particular case, we tried using a 
uh, knotless anchor knotless anchors are good because there are not there is no knot prominence in in these cases and it will give you a very, give you a very solid repair so this uh, knotless anchors had a very nice hold uh, of the labrum and then we will use a knotless drill to drill it up and then this is the this is the final repair that we see so this is the final repair after inserting a knotless anchor now this is the uh, interoperative pictures very small uh, incisions there is a small cannula which we have used with that uh, with the needle and the push lock anchor can be seen here which is uh, inserted for the labral repair now this is the interoperative uh, as iitv images demonstrating the drill of the push lock anchor and we can see that the drill is specifically extra articular occasionally there are uh, case reports of the drill which is migrating intra articularly so you need to rule that out now this is the follow up of the patient after 3 months she has got good range of motion with full function now case 2 is a 18 year old young boy who presented with pain in the groin difficulty in walking limp as well as painful internal rotation and the flexion of the hip joint and when we took the x ray we saw a very very large cam lesion and there is a whole kind of a dysplasia on the anterior superior neck region and the patient was very painful he was very painful in the internal rotation as well so we did the uh, mri scans and the ct scans and we can see that there is a significant cam lesion on the anterior lateral aspect of the neck and which is causing serious symptoms to this patient now the surgical plan this was a predominantly cam lesion there was a small pincer lesion and a small labral tear which was present so our predominantly plan was to do a cam resection with mild rim trimming along with the labral tear repair so we did a hip arthroscopy with cam resection labral repair and a small little bit of rim trimming and this is the post op view we can see that the uh, neck region where the, there was a cam lesion is now nicely debrided we did a adequate uh, osteoplasty of the anterior superior femoral neck and this is a post op 3d ct we can see that there is a very adequate uh, osteoplasty which can be seen the patient had a very nice improvement after the procedure and this is his 3 months follow up he has got good range of motion good internal external rotation and he was able to uh, walk also with very very minor minor limp just at at 3 months Uh, he was immensely satisfied with the procedure now the third case he is a 30 40 year old male patient presented with pain in the groin region along with catching and locking sensation the pain was on particular flexion angle and a, a internal rotation angle uh, we investigated and we find that there is a large uh, synovial pathology uh, specifically in the peripheral compartment in the anterior region there is a large kind of a lesion it's a loculated pathology and it is a space occupying pathology which is impinging on the movement so when we whenever the patient is doing flexion internal rotation this pathology is uh, blocking his movement so this was the intra articular view that we saw and we removed this um, pathology and block we send it for histopathology and it was suggestive of a localized pvns uh, as far as the uh, histopath was concerned so case 4 was a post uh, posterior dislocation of hip which was reduced close uh, after the uh, reduction there was a eccentric reduction and you can see a irregular kind of a, a, a Uh, joint space and uh, a ct was done which shows a small loose body inside the hip joint so this is a common indication in indian patients uh, with a loose body inside the hip joint with a post dislocation scenario in this particular patient we did a, we go ahead with a arthroscopy remove the loose body and the patient became pain free so these are basically the uh, conditions in which hip arthroscopy can be utilized in an indian perspective Uh, if you have any uh, questions you can um, uh, log in to our channel and write it on the comment box thanks a lot